And as we do this, let's go ahead and record. Right. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you uh, for that incredibly, incredibly kind introduction. I'm going to take just a couple of seconds here and get my screen oriented. And I just dropped a poll EV link into the chat. So if you have a separate device, please feel free to log into that. I'll be asking some questions throughout the presentation in hopes that we can uh, we can have inter a more interactive and lively uh, discussion. So it's not just one-sided uh, with me just sort of talking one way. All right, let's get this up and rolling. All right, can everyone see my Health Equities in North Carolina, a story page? And not my notes. <laughs> right. We're good. All right. Well, again, thank you uh, so much for allowing me uh, the time to talk with you about health and equity, uh, its history, and the present here in North Carolina. I'm looking forward to having a really, uh, really telling you a story uh, and then sort of having opportunity for us to uh, sit with this information and then have a conversation. And so I'm really, um, you know, as, and, as a, when I had my opportunity as an adjunct professor, I always wanted to give my audience or my classroom the opportunity uh, to speak back and, and to, and I sort of thrived off of that kind of uh, back and forth. Um, but today I plan to explore really the numerous aspects of this phenomenon uh, the reasons behind the catastrophic health outcomes in people of color um, and people who are of not who are, are traditionally white um, in the intersection of various social, legal, and economic reasons. We'll also discuss how the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as North Carolina General Assembly's refusal to expand Medicaid, has impacted these, these inequities. So again, I ask you, I urge you to jump on to, uh, if, you have a, if you have a cell phone, if you're tuned into this on your computer, if you have a cell phone, uh, tune, uh, go to your browser and enter pollev.com uh, forward slash William Munn 807. Um, you don't, you, you, you can accept the cookies. You don't have to download the app. Uh, this way we'll have an opportunity to sort of, um, sort of have some interaction. And so true to form, here is the first question. I'd like for folks to sort of one word, describe what causes health inequity in North Carolina. And we'll see here that you'll see my wife's practice response uh, in insurance. So uh, if you want to put insurance there again, uh, feel free to drop that in there. But let's take a couple of seconds and see what kind of questions or kind of feedback we have. Uh, on this question, one word to describe what causes health inequity uh, in, in North Carolina. Okay. All right. Okay, give me just a couple more seconds. I know folks are still coming in to the, uh, to the, to the conversation. So um, give us a couple more seconds. All right. So we have racism, insurance, racism, and prejudice. Um, so as I used in, in, in a previous conversation, I, I like to, start at the beginning of uh, sort of where I believe our healthcare or the belief um, and the impetus for the inequities in our present day health healthcare system and began. Um, and I took a couple of minutes to sort of watch the visualization that simulates the 315 years and the 20,528 voyages and millions of lives ripped from the, their homeland during the transatlantic slave trade. Because see, it is here that I believe that the seeds of health and equity we see throughout North Carolina, the South and North Carolina were sown. Um, and the dehumanization of Africans 
gave space to the justification of slavery and the justification of slavery gave space to the dehumanization of Africans. And so both set the stage for long-term health inequity, uh, income inequity, uh, housing inequity, all types of inequity. And so, we'll, but today we'll be focusing clearly on health inequity. So it's hard with our, you know, modern sensibilities to really understand how humans could treat other humans this way. Um, but that's the crux of it all. It's after all, how we begin to understand health disparities in the 21st century. Throughout today's talk, you'll see how outrageous ideologies justify the maltreatment of people and thus gave birth to policy, which then produces negative health outcomes. Well, you see this diagram of the slave ship. There was no consideration given to their health, whether it was mental or physical. If they got sick, or if they simply were claustrophobic and had a mental breakdown, they were thrown overboard. There was no solution, that was a solution to their health needs. And this is really the dehumanization at its core. It accomplished two things. It allowed slavers to conveniently reduce humans to chattel and the humanization absolved the slavers of their moral and Christian duty to treat Africans as fellow human beings. Because in their minds, biblically speaking, the curse of Ham had reduced Africans to much less than that. This thinking, this myth, this justification has morphed into a core tenet of a white supremacist ideology and subsequent policy that has had an incredible impact on health outcomes of people all across the United States and their quality of life, particularly people in color of color, but not only, but not specifically. This isn't a one-time thing. This is a recurring thing. Something ridiculous justifies dehumanization, dehumanizing behavior toward people of color in the form of policy. And this policy, this health policy creates a legacy of disparity. So I'll say this right here. The central argument is present health disparity has far less to do with individual policy, culture, or region, but instead with the persistent belief that some people deserve whatever maltreatment they deserve. And that's a tough pill to swallow. But in my research over time, and in my personal anecdotal experience living in the South as a Black man, it's sort of hard to get away from this. I've come up with this, with this, uh, and I believe this central argument is undergirded by this simple word equation. Ideology, a belief system, however you arrive at it, plus policy equals outcomes, either good or bad. We had an ideology that we were the, the greatest country in the world after World War II, and we believe that our scientific advancements could get us to the moon first, and we did it. Um, we we, that, that belief system uh, appropriated millions and billions of dollars into NASA. We tested, we did our thing for 15, 20 years, and then before we knew it, we were at the moon. So policy, ideology plus policy equals outcomes can be good or can be bad. So let's define each. The ideology, again, is a system of ideas, ideals, especially one that forms the basis of an economic or political theory and policy. And in the context of, of health and history of health and equity, we see that these, these myths presuppose ideology, uh, which in and itself is a well-developed evolution of the two. Policy, a course or principle of action adopted or proposed by a government, party, business, or individual. Oftentimes policymakers are the most, are the very most influential uh, ideologues. And lastly, outcome, the way a thing turns out, a consequence. Before we delve into the historical uh, application of the aforementioned model, I want to share with you the timeline that most African-Americans have somewhat hard, hardwired into our psyche. It's the ebb, ebb, ebb and flow of Black progress here in the United States. And we know that for every major step forward, Black people in marginalized communities achieve 
that generally there is a resistance or a backlash that will, that will rise up to seek to undo the very progress of our multiracial democracy. And, and embedded in these ebbs and flows have been the, the reality of health outcomes and health policy for people of color in the South in the United States and specifically North Carolina. So you had slavery from 1619 to 1863, or depending if you were in Galveston, Texas, all the way to 1865. Uh, you, had a, you had an emancipation, um, emancipation and reconstruction, but then you had the predictable redeemer movement and Jim Crow that ruled the South until the, um, until the 1860s. Uh, you also had, well, a, a, in, in, in addition to a, a legal reality, you also had an economy, a Southern sharecropper economy that locked many African-Americans into a, economic, a form of economic peonage, uh, which controlled their lives um, on top of the Jim Crow um, humiliation um, and and uh, lack of access to to the ballot box, but then in the '60s you had the civil rights movement, but then in the '70s you had urban renewal uh, and mass incarceration that began to undo a lot of the gains we saw in the '60s. Um, then in the '80s, um, part of the Reagan, Reagan revolution was an assault on government and a demonization of the investiture of our common good, which is the taxes. And then um, 20, 2008 and 2010, we sort of had, you know, the election of Barack Obama uh, and the and sort of the acknowledgement that we were continuing to morph and diversify as a country. And then from there, you had uh, the Tea Party and Trumpism. Um, and I think we're still firmly in the grips of that um, of, the, of that era. So let's talk about shadow slavery and health and equity in North Carolina. So you're, you know, you're from the very early origins of shadow slavery in North America. Europeans with medical training served the interests of the slave owners rather than enslaved patients. And so some transatlantic slave traders hired surgeons for the horrific middle passage in hopes of preserving their human cargo for maximum profit. In the slave markets of, Ant of the Ant antebellum South, you know, the physicians inspected the bodies of enslaved men, women, and children before start signing certificates uh, for buyers or sellers. And these insurance companies, uh, too, hired white doctors to examine the enslaved men and women before issuing, issuing excuse me, life insurance policies to protect slaveholders' financial well-being. So let's go back to that word equation. The belief in ideology is that African-American health only mattered to the interest of the slaveholders. What was the policy? Slaveholders and their clients would employ health inspection only to determine the fitness and value of their property. Outcome. No authentic consideration was given to Black physical and definitely not mental health. There was a logic of differences between blacks and whites based on the biblical readings or scientific dogma that would follow black Americans through slavery in the civil war. Slave owners saw black bodies that needed to be disciplined and controlled to remain sound. And white physicians assumed black bodies were fit for slavery and thrived under white control and feared that once slaves were emancipated that, that, that their increased rates of illness and demise were inevitable. High rates of morbidity and mortality brought, on, brought about by overwork and horrendous living conditions, sexual abuse, violence, and separation marked the life chances of enslaved Africans. So the idea was that only under white control could, could Black uh, the black bodies thrive, but in reality, they were uh, worked to early death, oftentimes in their 40s. Uh, by and and these the, it, it, certainly overwork malnutrition, uh, but then of course the trauma of sexual abuse and violence and um, it would certainly have an impact on mental and physical health. So Africans were different um, according to, to the belief in ideology, according to the Bible, and also needed to be controlled to, 
to thrive. Black bodies would become sickly if free. This was the thought process. This was the general accepted thought process uh, throughout the United States at this point. And maintenance of slavery in the American, so the, the policy was maintaining slavery in the, in the American South. And what ended up happening as a result was strengthening fugitive slave laws. So belief all of a sudden becomes policy. The reality is that overworked, mal malnutrition, malnourished, excuse me, beaten black bodies would succumb to early death. And then trauma would follow African Americans into the present. And this doesn't poof and disappear. Uh, those, those traumatic events have uh, manifested itself in many different ways. So let's talk a little bit about infant mortality. So as far back as 1662, colonial Virginia legislators made black women's childbearing a centerpiece of the system of chattel slavery when they passed a law stating that the status of a child would follow that of his or her mother. Uh, 17th century European exploration literature also depicted African women in comparison with European women as being especially capable of childbearing and uh, field labor. So when Britain and the United States banned the transatlantic trans slave trade in 1807 and 1808, uh, thereby cutting off the sources of African captives, slaveholders then began to bank their future on, increasingly on the fertility of enslaved women. Uh, and although slave, enslaved midwives and nurses supplied much of the plantation health care, Slave owners called upon white physicians for cases such as assisting difficult births with forceps. Examining the causes of an enslaved woman's infertility or investigating cases of infant mortality. So uh, predictably infant mortality in plantation settings remained high. In the South an estimated 50% of enslaved infants were stillborn or died within their first year of life. Without a well-developed field of pediatrics, white physicians had little to offer and consequently they blamed enslaved mothers and midwives using harsh gendered, using harsh and gendered racist language for infant deaths were, that were more than likely a result of a mother's hard labor and poor nutrition. So the belief again in ideology was that the enslaved fertility only mattered in the service of hard labor and production. And so the policy um, on plantations were that pregnant enslaved mothers had to work throughout their term. The outcome was predictable. Enslaved infant mortality was very high. Mothers lost children and experienced high anguish and trauma. So let's go to after the Civil War. So rising in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, the rising rates of illness and death of newly emancipated Black citizens were caused by the loss of the, what did exist is very uh, minimal uh, plantation healthcare. So there was then nothing there for, uh, for Black citizens. Um, Illness and disease epidemics were brought on by starvation, overcrowding, and the disruption um, of the plantation system. And most significant, the inability and unwillingness of an underdeveloped and racist Southern public health system to take up the slack. There was an increased fear that dependency, note that word, dependency on governmental largesse would undermine white authority and support black citizenship. And this made the introduction of public health service systems uh, difficult politically. So the belief was that providing a robust government run healthcare system will make blacks dependent on the system. You've never heard that before, right? Um, so po the policy was that no healthcare system of note emerged in the South during epidemics, during a time of great upheaval, uh, during uh, smallpox and yellow fever outbreaks, there was no healthcare system. There was a refusal to build one out. 
And as a result, black citizens suffered from lack of access to care. So I wanna introduce the concept of deservedness, which I think has broad applicability, not only to our healthcare access politics, but to uh, domestic policy in general. One cannot expect equitable health outcomes in North Carolina when a plurality of policymakers are fully committed to maintaining a structure of care delivery based on the fickle principle of deservedness. In Jim Downs' book, Sick from Freedom, we learned that after the Civil War, healthcare leaders vacillated uh, with whether to treat the newly emancipated suffering from uh, the smallpox and epidemic that raged across the South. Decision makers struggled because they wanted African Americans just healthy enough to return to plantation work, but not rigorous enough, vigorous enough to be whole and free as to upset the racial hierarchy that trapped them into a state of subservience. And so mismanaged care contributed to the deaths of many, as many as 60,000 people who died in the outbreak. I urge each of you to, to, you know, to grab a copy of this book and take a look at it and read it. It's, it's, it's incredibly enlightening. Excuse me. So the belief in ideology was while that the emancipated health mattered, it only mattered to serve the, the financial interests of the former slave owners. It created a barely functioning medical system to manage the epi an epidemic only to serve enough blacks to prevent the plague from entering into white neighborhoods. And as a result, 60,000 black people died. So let's talk about the eugenics program in North Carolina. For more than 40 years, North Carolina state wide eugenics pro uh, program forcibly sterilized nearly 7,600 7, people, many of whom were black. And the scope of the program extended to the recipients of public welfare. In a paper written by William, Dr. William Darity, uh, he argued that the eugenic sterilizations were authorized with the intent uh, of reducing the African Americans in the state genocide by any other name. So the belief in ideology was that Black, Black and North Carolinians were considered genetically unfit in an undesirable and surplus population. I mean, those words were actually in, in, in the documentation uh, surrounding eugenics. The state of North Carolina operated a eugenics program for more than 40 years. And for a 10 year span, the program was tailored to breed out the offspring of Blacks in the state. And as the outcome, uh, 7,600 men and women were forcibly sterilized. And this episode has, has created significant distrust in government and healthcare entities in, African, in the African-American community. So let's talk about mass incarceration as a function of healthcare policy. North Carolina has about 6, 67,000 people behind bars. The rate of people in jail and prison has increased dramatically since 1978, and the state has one of the highest incarceration rates uh, in the country. But all things are not equal. People of color, particularly black people, are over overrepresented in North Carolina's prisons and jails. And you might ask, how does this affect healthcare in, North, in the United States, in North Carolina? Let's, do, let's have a little history lesson here. Nixon's war on, on drugs was largely operated in the black community, although usage rates for, for drugs were nearly identical across race. And, and over-policing justified people, America's collective belief that black people needed controlling and landed far too many in prison. Unnecessary contacts with law enforcement too often produce incidents of police brutality which is a healthcare crisis of its own. And an inordinate number of black North Carolinians in prison inhibits their ability to work and benefit from, from, a, from employer 
sponsored health insurance to cover their families. So the ideology and belief system here was that Black North Carolinians are predisposed to poverty, violence, and crime. And so the best thing to do is to systemically over-police them, control them, keep them in their own communities, and, and operate a racial profiling system in a war on drugs uh, that, that exposed them to unwarranted police brutality. And what was the outcome? 55% of all jail population is Black, while only making up 22% of the state's population. And then by removing a breadwinner um, from, the, from the house coal, it decreases the chance that employer-sponsored health insurance can benefit the Black family. Also, police brutality maims and kills. It is, in, its, in and of itself, a healthcare crisis. So let's talk about the Affordable Health Care Act, Affordable Care Act. Uh, ACA brought the prospect of Medicaid expansion to the forefront in 2010, and ACA had three primary goals. And for the sakes of today's context, we'll talk about the third goal, expanding the Medicare program, Medicaid, excuse me, program to, is to all adults with incomes below 138% of the federal poverty level. For state, for states like North Carolina, largely Southern states that have not expanded Medicaid, um, only those who are pregnant with children or who are responsible for a child 18 uh, years or of age or younger, blind or have a disability or have a family member in the household with a disability, or if you're 65 years of age and older and meet strict, strict and meet, meet strict income limits, are you eligible for Medicaid? So we see these really, really strict, um, strict limits on the, on the ability to access uh, this program. And so as a result, uh, those who are 138% of the federal poverty line and above are eligible for subsidies on the ACA marketplace. But that causes a lot of problems for low earning North Carolinians, folk who are working every day. Uh, people earning just above 40% of the federal poverty line working in retail or as home health professionals do not qualify for Medicaid. And so those caught in the middle uh, between 40 and 138% of the federal poverty line are often working, co working folk caught in what we call the coverage gap with no access to health insurance. So here's a scenario, everyday scenario in North Carolina. Um, single working mother of one, works at a rural independent grocer in Nash County. Uh, employer does not offer employer uh, uh, health insurance. She makes about $8 an hour, works 40 hours a week, never takes a vacation, earns about $16,320 annually. This person does not qualify for Medicaid. Child does, but she does not. So as, as, as such, Medicaid uh, expansion was the opportunity to cover just those kinds of folk. Um, however, states opting not to implement the program, millions of uninsured adults remain outside the reach of ACA. Um, and then from 2017 to 2018, non-expansion states saw a significant increase in their uninsured rate, while expansion states did not. And as we see a sample of counties where ACA dropped, the uh, rate of uninsurance initially, the combination of the refusal of Medicaid expansion and the destructive policy from the Trump administration has generated a bump up in uninsurance. The states in the orange are the states that have still refused to expand Medicaid. Uh, and by no um, coincidence, these are the African American, these are the states in the country that have the highest African American percentage by state. Who are the uninsured adults who could, could come, become eligible for Medicaid if North Carolina uh, expanded? Half of them are people of color. This could do incredible things for our um, health care disparities in this in health care access and health outcomes, health, health disparity outcomes in this country. Recording in progress. So uh, if, if North Carolina's General Assembly expanded Medicaid, an estimated 500,000 North Carolinians could gain access 
um, to your life-saving care. We save more lives. There'll be increased access to preventive screenings and more people would uh, have access to care and treatment for substance use disorders, which is, which is critical. We overall would have better health outcomes and thriving communities. And by and large, North Carolinians back expansion. Here are two polls uh, in the last two years that, that show uh, you know, overwhelming support for expansion. So um, after realizing that Southern states were going to be um, stubborn and their and their willingness to expand expand uh, expand medicaid uh the Biden administration and democrats in congress introduced uh a, a provision that would allow non-expansion states to take up expansion by providing an ex an additional temporary fiscal incentive uh to to implement expansion and under that uh, states uh, can now receive the 90% ACA match. Um, and so obviously if, if states did that, millions of folk, 2.2 uh, million folk would be able to have access uh, to affordable and accessible health care. Uh, so states, of course, that do not have or do not have expansion are eligible for a five percentage point increase in the state's regular or traditional match rate or FMAP. So all that all that um, to say is that an estimated increase in the traditional match rate would more than offset the state's cost for expansion in every state. And so in North Carolina specifically, that number would equate to an extra 1.7 to 2.4 billion dollars for North Carolina to address whatever the cost would be for expansion and a number of other things that would exceed it. So in North Carolina, we see that we, we would receive 1.7 billion, and that's a conservative number, 790, uh, 790 million in South Carolina and 1.2 billion in Tennessee. And so after the two years, states will continue to receive the 90% match uh, and, and Medicaid expansion in, in the remaining 12, not 12 non-expansion states would really have the opportunity to reach millions of people. And not expanding Medicaid has its costs. I'm going to skip this video because uh, it's taking a little bit more time to get through these slides than I anticipated. But this is what happens when spite becomes public policy. Medicaid expansion has been proven to drive down overall insurance rates in states who have accepted. And our tax dollars are going to funding other states' programs. Um, we've decided throughout the entire epidemic pandemic to not expand Medicaid. And half of the new recipients of healthcare would be people of color. It would dramatically address our disparities as it relates to healthcare. But the uh, belief in ideology and the things that we hear from the other side are the federal government will renege on funding. This is untrue. And that lazy people would get health insurance and then not want to work. Although the people who would get health insurance are those who are working and not being offered health insurance otherwise. And so what was a policy decision? To reject Medicaid expansion. And the re result um, is the rejection of $1.7 billion dollars in federal incentives, uh, and more than 200,000 North Carolinians remain in the coverage gap, and we reject an opportunity to close the racial health access gap and support rural hospitals. So I'll talk brief. I'll, I'll talk quickly about the COVID-19 and how that hit people of color particularly hard. This is a snapshot of, of June 2020 when, um, when 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 COVID was really ramping up in North Carolina and across the state. So although African Americans made up 22% of the state, uh, they made up 26% uh, of all COVID-19 cases and 34% of all, all COVID-19 deaths. So the question is why? Well, differing employment outcomes have uh, in, in higher rates of being uninsured. Uh, when your healthcare policy is based on work and people of color uh, are being are discriminated against in terms of, of what kinds of jobs or even in, or jobs in general, then it's obviously going to have an impact on uh, how they're able to be insured. Another reason is that hospitals and specialty centers in North Carolina, particularly rural North, eastern, northeastern rural North Carolina, are further away from, from uh, people of color 
in uh, in that part of the state. And since 2010, uh, rural, seven rural hospitals in North Carolina have closed, three of them in the eastern part of the state. And these closures leave the state with 17 counties without a state licensed hospital. It's harder to get regular checkups and follow ups. And this, of course, puts folks at greater risk for chronic disease. Another reason is poor patient experience. When African Americans do receive care, medical care, uh, studies indicate that many communicate symptoms and concerns, and providers often ignore them or downplay them, putting them at risk. Um, there was a tragic case of a gentleman named Jason Hargrove in the very early days of the pandemic. He complained about his, uh, his COVID symptoms. He was sitting home and said that he'll be okay. Um, of course, he passed away in, you know, a couple of days later. Um, and this tragic case alone could be just seen as poor medical advice, but put in the context of the plethora of other examples of racial bias in healthcare, it demonstrates a damaging pattern. I myself have lost two family members, an uncle and a grandfather, uh, due to misdiagnosis, things that, fo 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 things that folks should have never uh, or medical professionals that have never missed. Um, and so I've lost uh, an uncle and, and, and my grandfather uh, to earlier deaths because of that. Um, and an example of a systemic nature of this problem can be seen in an example from 2019, finding that even an algorithm designed to predict when patients would benefit from extra care was dramatically found to dramatically and consistently underestimate when sick black patients need specialized attention. Getting a little bit of feedback. Okay, there we go. So again, uh, food insecurity and chronic illness. If folk aren't able to get access to foods, uh, fresh foods and vegetables, and this is a huge problem in, 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 in communities of color, uh, then it sets them up for long-term chronic illness. Um, and this is something that in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, um, 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 comorbidities were huge uh, predictors in poor outcomes, particularly pre-vaccine in terms of, uh, in, uh, you know, um, uh, being able to survive COVID-19. Here's a map of 339 food deserts um, throughout North Carolina. Um, and these are scattered all throughout the state. The, these are all census tracts. Um, and so it's, it's, it blows your mind that these are uh, these spaces um, are so geographically, you know, um, spark, uh, spread out. But pretty much in every county in this state, we have uh, a community that lives, um, you know, more than a mile in the urban area and 20 miles in rural areas from a nearest supermarket. And this has huge, huge implications. It's not as, it's not a snap of the finger solution, but it's definitely something that we have to, as a state and a society, address. Environmental racism, industries of potentially life-threatening byproducts are often located in or near communities of color. Compromised air and water quality are byproducts of a lack of a regulatory oversight and environmental racism. And nearly 25% of North Carolinians will live within one mile of an EPA polluter, but 44% are at, and, um, of African-American residential close to clusters live within, within one mile of an EPA polluter. And this increases the, the development of chronic illnesses like diabetes, asthma, and the like. And lastly, one of the reasons African-Americans were much more likely to be to suffer and die from or, or contract and die from COVID-19 is because many African-Americans were like more likely to be a seen, deemed essential, putting them at greater risk for COVID-19. And African-Americans, because of our less than uh, honest uh, employment system, were overrepresented in these occupations, such as food service, production work, and less flexibility to work from home and effectively quarantine. Uh, Employment trends driven by, as I mentioned earlier, press and inequity have created tough choices, many choosing to risk infection in order to maintain employment. And so um, a broken healthcare infrastructure uh, produced disparate outcomes for people of color. Uh, COVID-19 swept the nation largely unprepared for its unpredictable lethality. Even less prepared were North, Carolinians, North Carolina communities of color because of longstanding structural inequities in employment and healthcare access. Too many people were told that 
they were essential workers, but not compensated as much, nor protected with PPE. The stories from my family members down east here in North Carolina um, are atrocious. Residential segregation has relegated communities of color near sites of pollution, making them more susceptible to asthma and other comorbidities. So the ideology, Black North Carolinians, <laughs> in the beginning, Black North Carolinians cannot catch uh, COVID-19. I mean, I heard that numerous times. And so the lack of race equity impact analysis to plan on how to better protect communities of color from the brunt of the pandemic's impact uh, then ended up resulting in for the first 10 to 12 months of the pandemic, community color, communities of color had higher infection and death rates than whites in, uh, or actually in the entire state of North Carolina. So what does health inequity look like geographically? I mean, we've talked about all these policies that have sort of baked in uh, over the last 160, uh, actually longer than that, 400 years in this, in this country. What does that look like in North Carolina geographically? And so a coworker of mine and I did a study where we hypothesized that high racist ideology and policy took deeper, deeper roots in regions with higher proportions of enslaved people allowing systems of oppression and isolation to flourish long after emancipation. So we explored the relationship between the prevalence of slavery in North Carolina in 1860 and present day social health outcomes. And we expect to find correlations or relationships between the number of enslaved and various indicators, suggesting that while the formal institution of slavery was dissolved some 150 years ago, intentional forms controlled, stretch of control stretch into the 20th century, blunting African-American progress through policy designed to keep them disenfranchised, dependent, and unhealthy. And what do we find? So what do we do? We looked at the 86 counties that were present in 1860 and their slave populations matched them with 20 socio health factors from 2019 to explore relationships Relationship, the, the, the research question, is there a relationship between the 1860 county level populations of enslaved Africans, African-Americans and present day social health uh, factors? <laughs> and um, what we found was absolutely. Uh, here is here's a couple of scatter plots. Uh, so it says that counties that had larger slave populations in 1860s uh, of course, are home to more African American population today. That's pretty well established. But then here we go: uh, large, larger slave populations in the 1860s are more food insecure than peer, peer counties today. Counties that have large slave populations in 1860 tend to have more preventable hospital stays today. And counties that had larger slave populations in the 1860s have more cases of poor and or fair health today. And counties that have larger slave populations today have fewer places to exercise. Uh, have more, uh, the same, have more people with diabetes. Um, and so when we take a look at today, today's pop African-American populations, uh, so counties, so when I took the data set from 2019, African-American population or percent African-American populations and paired them up with the other factors. Um, to do a second round of analysis, we see uh, the same thing. Um, they tend to have more preventable, counties with larger African-American populations tend to have more preventable hospital stays, more cases of poor, uh, poor or fair health, uh, fewer places to exercise, more people who have diabetes. And this was the standout um, standout measure here, standout variable, uh, more food insecure. This was the strongest predictor of African-American population. And so I think this was definitely the standout variable, one that I didn't expect to have such a strong uh, relationship to, to the dependent variable. So I was in graduate school, I had the opportunity to sort of identify, uh, I, I had an argument, I said, there's not really two North Carolinas, there's not an urban and a rural North Carolina, there's three North Carolinas, and the third North Carolina that we don't talk about is the Black Belt, and it's the part of North Carolina where the cotton slave plantation economy reigned supreme, uh, but after that fact, there was intentional disinvestment, and so um, 
using research and uh, and census data and uh, and previous researchers, we were able to 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 define these 29 counties as being black belt counties. Um, these were counties with sus substantial con concentrations of African-American population, agrarian landscapes, and low, low levels of urbanization, limited non-agricultural economic opportunities, high poverty and employment, uh, lower levels of educational attainment, um, slow or uh, slow rates of population growth or population decline. So these are the 29 counties. Keep a keep a mental note of these counties. So this is the this is the diabetes prevalence in North Carolina counties in 2019. Access to, um, and and obviously the darker the color, the 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 worse it is. And so uh, it looks like it, you take a look at Mecklenburg County, take a look at Wake County, the triangle, the triad. You see the darker blue uh, when it gets the orange, and dark orange. That means that means not good. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, so we have fewer exercise exercise opportunities in the in that same predictable belt of North Carolina. Age adjusted mortality in North Carolina counties. Um, food insecurity, same problem, same same trend. Life expectancy, same trend. Poor or fair health in North Carolina counties same trend. Uh, preventable hospital stays, same geographic trend. Severe or cost burden in, in North Carolina counties. And this is a significant predictor of a social determinant of health. Same trend. Unemployment in North Carolina counties, same trend. Uninsured in North Carolina counties, same trend. What's up, little man? I'm on a presentation. I'll get to you in a little bit, okay? All right, I'll see you in a little bit. I'll be with that. I'm almost done. All right, years of potential lives lost in North Carolina counties, uh, same trend, but it's not just health. When you apply the resilient, resilience capacity index, uh, which is a statistic uh, summarizing a region's status on 12 factors suggested to influence the ability of a region uh, to bounce back from a stressor, we start to see the same kinds of trends. Uh, and these are, many of these things are social determinants of health, right? Um, so you have three different buckets, economic capacity, community connectivity, social demographics, and here are all the po uh, positive facing variables uh, that define whether or not a um, county is strong, resilient, and, and, and able to take a shock like uh, the economic downturn in 2010, or in this case, COVID-19. And so it gives us an RCI index score, uh, which tells and which shows us that Scotland County is the least resilient county in the state and Wake County is the most resilient. But there, what, what, what do we see again? We see that same band of counties in dark orange being much less resilient. And it's just incredible. Um, so here are the 20 most resilient counties in the state. Here are the 20 least resilient counties in the state. Keep an eye on these maps here. That's the, on the bottom is the 1860 slave population by county. And on the top is the county is the map that I just showed you of the 20 least resilient counties in 2018. I mean, it just doesn't get any more clear to that what kind of damage that we've done and in in intentional underinvestment in this part of the state. So also, again, as I mentioned before, the Cotton Belt of North Carolina. Uh, again, so here are, here's a, a, a visualization of the Black Belt counties in North Carolina, as I mentioned before, the research and the Resilience Capacity Index map that, um, that Catherine Foster from, uh, from Berkeley um, was able to put together for us to use. So now that we're at this point uh, in the program, I'm gonna stop and ask folks, we have just a couple more slides left. One word, uh, so I, I played a pretest post-test on you all. So I want you, I want now folks can sort of log on to uh, that poll everywhere uh, link that I shared. Uh, what is one word that, that now describes health inequity in North Carolina? Okay, I see slavery. Slavery, okay. History, great. Slavery again, all right.
white supremacy history. Okay. You have about 15 more seconds. Mm -hmm. General Assembly. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Thank you. So in conclusion, whether it's a lack of health and uh, of employer sponsored health insurance because of employment discrimination, whether it's the outright refusal of a policy that can directly provide people of color with access to health care, or the thoughtless mass incarceration of thousands of black North Carolinians uh, with off oftentimes impedes their ability to get a steady job, let alone health insurance for the rest of their lives. It brings us back to this point. You know, present health disparity has far left to do less to do with individual public policy, culture, or region, but instead the persistent belief that some people deserve whatever maltreatment they receive, and a toleration and often willing acceptance of public policy that has disparate and negative impacts on people of color. I'll say this again, deservedness. One cannot expect equitable health outcomes in North Carolina when the plurality of policymakers are fully committed to maintaining a structure of care delivery based on the fickle principle of deservedness. And if the majority, the good people in our society are comfortable with their own statuses and stay silent, nothing will change. So I have a, another question, um, two questions actually. Um, why is it that North Carolina, the United States, the country that is amongst the world's wealthiest is the only one that does not guarantee universal health care for all of its citizens? And this is a conversation you know, that, you know, that the good host asked me, um, asked me about, and I thought it was, you know, I thought it was profound. Um, and the 1619 Project has done, uh, has done an incredible article on this very topic. Um, but I'd love for folks just to sort of, you know, based off of what has been shared today, um, in a couple of words, you know, why, why do we not, guarantee universal health care uh, for all for all of our citizens. It's not because it costs too much, because we're currently spending way too much money. Um, but I think we have to be thoughtful. Yep. Yep. Compromise is born of white supremacy. That is a very, very good response. Belief in exceptionalism, <laughs> right? Split of the tradition, traditions rule, yep. You have about 10 more seconds. Same reasons slaves were bought here and treated as non-human. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for being such an interactive group. I appreciate that. So I want to leave with a positive, um, positive facing question. And I really, really appreciate you all for bearing with me for more than 50 minutes. Um, it's a long story to tell. It's a lot of data. It's a lot of information, but it's a story that has to be told. And it's a reckoning that we have to face if things are ever to get better. And so how do we change the conversation around health access when we talk about uh, Medicaid expansion, or we talk about Medicaid, or we talk about universal health care, and the opposition or someone you're sitting across has a visceral reaction to um, health care access for more people, uh, for people of color, for people they don't necessarily uh, are very comfortable with. How do we change that conversation? Um, I have thoughts, but um, all my thoughts may not they're, they're not 
Uh, they're not your thoughts. And I think our thoughts have to come together and create a movement, uh, create health access for folks. So how do we change this conversation, y'all? And maybe this is a question that I can reserve for the, um, so if you wanna drop it in here in the next 20 seconds, that's fine. Or maybe this is a question I'm ask, I'd like to ask the group and sort of get some feedback then. Ask a question to get at how did you arrive at this? Okay. Don't stop talking about it because people disagree or are uncomfortable. Share history and data. Thank you so, so much for that. Um, I think that, um, you know, comfort is the uh, foundation of maintaining the status quo. Inform people in a context where appropriate action looks possible, okay? You get about 10 more seconds. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate the um, opportunity to just share this space with you. Um, and um, I look forward to your questions. Um, I Have I stopped sharing my screen? I think so, yeah. So uh, yeah, look forward to your questions. Again, thank you uh, for allowing me to share uh, my research, my life experiences. Um, and, um, and with you in the hopes that we have a more full uh, conversation when we talk about healthcare disparity, uh, when we talk about why it is that we don't have a more inclusive um, and more operational um, uh, healthcare um, system. So again, thank you. And I'll turn it back over to our wonderful host. Karen, um, you and I can look through the chat questions together, but um, as we transition to some questions for Dr. Munn, I wanna thank you, Dr. Munn, for a very um, uh, enlightening, <laughs> disturbing, and I'm glad it's disturbing me because without troubled waters, I don't think we're gonna get uh, anywhere. So thank you so much for having such an elusive, um, clear explanation of where we've been and uh, also, hinting us at where we need to go. Um, I didn't say this, but um, in my response to your poll, I might have added something about the league taking a role here. I wonder if you have any thoughts about how an organization that's made up of mostly white, middle-aged, middle-class folks could impact the conversation. Do you have any observations that would be of value? I'll just kick the question and answer session off with that. And then Karen, I hope um, you can maybe take it from there. But Dr. Mun, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, where, where you started in, in inviting me to come and have this conversation um, is, 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 is an incredible starting point. I think uh, moving forward um, that, um, excuse me, um, I think moving forward that um, being, you know, uh, being the thought leaders and pushing back against, um, you know, whether it be uh, conservative lawmakers um, uh, arguing in favor of work requirements or some sort of means, means testing, being the voice as an organization to uh, unilaterally push back and, and, and call it what it is, um, is, is incredibly helpful. And I think once, um, you know, racism, um, once, you know, discrimination um, becomes uh, something that is ostracized and no longer tolerated, um, then we are able to move this conversation, whether it's health policy, whether it's educational attainment, whatever it is, I think we have to make uh, the, we have to make the um, uh, conversation space or dialogue uh, there's no space for folk to be able to retreat to the corner um, and be okay with um, with treating other people um, differently, uh, with 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 explicitly denying folk uh, access to care, or implicitly 
uh, using systems to do so. And so I think calling things out, uh, you know, using press releases, using, um, you know, quotes to, to when, um, when a lawmaker um, or when an organization uh, that has um, intentions counter to where we're trying to get to, uh, I think calling it out is the biggest thing. Uh, and then standing by those principles, when things, um, you know, you have to, <laughs> you have to give our, um, our, our, our friends to the right is that when they can be dead wrong, but they'll be loud and dead, dead wrong about being dead wrong. And so we have to be just as, as enthusiastic to be dead right, uh, even though it may not be initially popular. And so I think, um, you know, as an av and I, this is a shameless plug, as an advocacy organization, we're always looking for partners to sort of amplify uh, those data points and, um, and 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 the point and the and the pieces that we get from back map back mapping, uh, we're looking for advocates and organizations like yourselves to sort of amplify those messages and hopefully um, you know that that that'll make it that'll break its way through in time. Hope that answers your question. That's great, thank you, Karen. Robin, you took the question right out of my mouth. Was you know how how can the league as a group do more. We've we've tried, we've worked with NC Justice on Medicaid expansion for years. And mm -hmm. I guess another question I have now is, is in the in the realm of education, um, bringing our young people up to know the history seems like a crucial part, but of course there are roadblocks there too. And I just wondered what you what you have to say about how we can bring young people along. Yeah, no, that's that's huge. Uh, one of the things that is, is, is been incredibly disturbing over the last couple of months, uh, you know, our uh, states and boards of education moving to sort of silence this kind of conversation. This presentation in many states now would not be, you know, you couldn't have it. I could not go to a high school and have this presentation, no matter how positive and enlightening it, it might be. Uh, but I think, you know, but they can't stop our conversations around dinner tables and, and, and being able to use the resources like this. Um, so I'm a, I'm a nerd and, um, and, and, and I'm not suggesting folk do this, but uh, there was a conversation around gerrymandering uh, the other uh, the Zoom, Zoom presentation and happened to be around seven o'clock. Well, that's dinner time and stuff, but I put the conversation on TV for my five-year-old, my six-year-old, and my 11-year-old to watch. And so they were able to then be, you know, be uh, showered with all this information. A lot of, I'm sure they didn't understand, but sort of just surrounding them with, you know, different, um, with, with, with the information uh, around the dinner table where things can't be regulated, you know, to a T. Uh, or or, or um, using our opportunity as parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles uh, to just, just, you know, every opportunity to sort of inform and tell that story, uh, invite folk like myself. I, I am happy to go anywhere and have this conversation. Uh, again, I've lived it. Uh, I've lost family members. I've seen family members uh, fret about going back to work. Uh, you know, I have a mother-in-law who can't survive her and didn't want to go back to work. Uh, because um, she, um, you know, was, you know, compromised, you mean compromised, but, um, you know, being able to tell those stories and, um, you know, and share these things with your, with the youth around the dinner table is the, is the most powerful education experience that I have personally had. I think, you know, I learned a lot of things in school, but coming home and having those conversations with my parents and them, them being able to put it in context um, and it, it's been incredible. So if you can have Zoom conversations, have Zoom, info, you know, informational sessions with your kids, I promise you it's amazing. I got a lot of questions from them. They loved it. Uh, but I think more over it, just looking for opportunities uh, to bring in diverse thinking, um, in particular, uh, particularly, you know, around uh, race, around oppression, um, around, you know, we, we should, you know, I think that every, um, every seventh grader is, you know, as, as painful as it might be, needs to know about, you know, about Wilmington in 1898, 
I've had to have that conversation. I didn't enjoy it, but it's a conversation that needs to be had because we don't, if we don't have that conversation, then it'll, it'll, the kinds of things like that will happen again. So uh, yeah, dinner time, dinner time education. Uh, that's, that's my, uh, that's, that's my, that's my response. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Karen, if there isn't another question in the chat, is might there be one you want to ask? Um, while while you look, let me put Gary Kenton on the spot here for a minute. Gary, if you would unmute, um, Dr. Mun. Gary is our advocacy chair on the state board, uh, and you oh, know okay. we are the League of Women Voters. But Gary's a <laughs> member, as is my husband. So <laughs> we could invite you to join. We'd be glad to have you. The other important word in that in that name, that title is voters, because we've always been about voting and getting people to the polls. So Gary, I don't know if you have an observation that you'd like to make as what you see the advocacy role of the league uh, in getting voters up to speed. Um, you know, I think sometimes we make choices uh, that we wouldn't want to make if we had better information. And it's hard to educate people about healthcare outside of their own personal experience. But if one of you or both of you could just reflect on that for a minute. Gary, you wanna speak your thoughts? Sure, uh, always happy when Robin puts me on the spot. Um, <laughs> one, thing, one, thing, one thing I would pick Go up, ahead, love, Gary. one thing I would pick up on is just, we talked before about not retreating to our corners. I think the league is coming along in terms of, we, a lot of times we don't recognize when we're retreating into our corners. You know, white people have had certain information and, you know, I'm reading the 1619 Project and I thought I knew a lot of the stuff and my mind is blown by some of this stuff. So I think the league, thanks to work that Robin and others have done, has engaged with DEI and is, is getting better. And I think we are, one of the things the league is doing better is seeking more partnerships and taking data from other organizations. So um, you know, thanks for all of this. So all I, you know, I think the league is doing better coming to grips with its own racist history and then uh, trying to build on that and wrestling with it. I'm on the state board and we are wrestling with what to do um, about it. And I, I guess the wrestling isn't adequate. We need to do some things, but it is uh, better than it was. <laughs> Robin, here's a good question from Chris. I like the development of a resilience index. I wonder how that correlates with being an active and effective voter. Mm, good question. Your thoughts, Dr. Mon? Yeah, and I think that uh, one of the most, uh, whenever I go to a website or I see a piece of material, I wanna know how my hometown is doing. Um, and I want to know specifically, and I'm working on a data project with some friends right now um, that really examines the effectiveness of elected officials, giving them a score uh, based on a number of different metrics. So, for example, you know, educational attainment, uh, you know, school to prison pipeline, uh, you know, median household income, you know, th those kinds of measures. Um, I think one that encompasses all of those kinds of measures, and then, you know, quite frankly, calls the policymakers who um, have been in power um, or are in power responsible for, you know, either economic development or healthy health outcomes, call them the task on it. Like, you know, I, one thing that um, I, I, you know, I, I'm very thankful for, you know, for in my graduate school ed you know, education was really speaking truth to power and not uh, backing down. And there are a lot of legislators on, on both sides of the aisle who just not gotten it done. And I think the development of a resilience index and brought to the appropriate level of public consciousness really would put kind of the pressure on folk and it would address health. It would address, um, you know, it would, it would address police, police brutality. Um, so it would put the police chiefs and the sheriffs on 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 um, on, on 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 call and watch, as well as it would if the if the if the rates of crime were out of control. And so I think we have to look at this you know, from a holistic perspective. Uh, but I mean, I love um, I love the kind of indexes um, if they're if they are 
articulate and inform and inform the, po the populace in, the, in in a positive and useful way. Uh, we don't want to put out a number of seventy six and folk that know have no idea what that what that means. But I think as as long as we're able to articulate what these things mean, um, we'll um, come on. Uh, we'll 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 be a, we'll be in a better place. And so, um, just really, I I I I'm, I would love to be a part of that conversation to sort of develop that sort of thing uh, moving forward. We welcome your guest. <laughs> oh, this is William the Fourth. Say hi, William. Hey. <laughs> Come in, William. Hi, William. <laughs> Dad's doing a great job. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hey, good daddy. Hey, good daddy. Dr. Munn, I can't quote the um, research, but uh, I participated I in a webinar last yeah. fall that um, from County Health Ranking Group. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Johnson. And Very they said that. that they said that uh, communities that were more engaged and they used voter registration as one of the measures of engagement had mm -hmm. better health outcomes, sort of the mapping that you were doing. They yeah. did voter registration, which really piqued my interest as a league. Sure. Because I think when we do voter registration, we really are engaging with people on a number of levels, um, personal to begin with, hello, sure. how are you? <laughs> and then learning about their life and what matters to them, of course. Yeah. and then getting them to the polls um, yes so, yes uh, you know that group yes and i and i think that it, it, it's it's so incredibly important like you just said you're going to community i'm huge on this uh you're going to community and you're talking to people um and you're registering them to vote you're asking them are they registered to vote but you're also asking them what's important to you um in in your life um i'm part of um the you know the board of uh league of conservation voters and they want to talk about you know environmental issues and resilience but a lot of times they realize that, that in order to get into the door and to pique folks interest and get them to be lifelong voters they have to meet them where these folk are and a lot of times you know folk you know are struggling to you know keep their utilities on and struggling with unemployment and struggling with other things one of the fa most fascinating things uh the board came back with and or or, or or the staff came back to us with was that when they went out in the communities the number one concern in Fayetteville in the Fayetteville area <laughs> was Medicaid expansion. And so they went in and started talking to people about Medicaid expansion and in, 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 in with the intent, you know, of, you know, broadening the conversation and then eventually getting to environmental issues. And it had wonderful effects. I think asking people what matters to them, um, and it may not be your bread and butter issue at that point in time, but uh, ensuring that your engagement with voters is not transactional it's, to the extent possible. It's something that will continue. You're building a relationship over time. Uh, it produces uh, the kind of not only, you know, you'll end up turning them into voters, but hopefully lifelong career voters uh, that then can, you know, themselves become leaders uh, in their own communities. Um, um, and, and they directly see how their involvement in the process uh, it's having an impact. One of the things, again, when you're dealing in Eastern North Carolina and people again are struggling, they're looking for whatever investment of time and energy that they are making in those 24 hours to have an immediate impact. And sometimes registering to vote and voting does not have does not translate to having that immediate impact. And so we have to understand that. And sometimes we have to come back and we have to develop those relationships. And so transforming that and making sure that that's, a, that's, a, that's an integral part of our engagement as, as it relates to, you know, registering people to vote or issue identification is really important. But I think it's, I think it's, I think it's, I think that's right on target. Thank you. Karen, what else do we have? For I don't see any more questions in the chat. Does anybody want to raise your hand or add something? This I don't mind. Thank you so much, Dr. Mann. I uh, am Robin's uh, right hand man. I hope she doesn't have a left hand man. <laughs> I'm on the right here. Um, Tuskegee always stands out as a horrible beacon. 
But your history clearly shows us Tuskegee's a blip. This has been going on, eradication of opportunity and good health for centuries. And just recently in Philadelphia, uh, a distinguished professor of dermatology has now passed away. They got into his files and found out that he was doing research uh, on various skin conditions using various uh, experimental therapies on prisoners at Holmesburg Prison, Eastern Prison in, in uh, Philadelphia, which surprisingly has 70% black men incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And he was using these therapies to the point where they would get into difficulties and troubles. And it was justified because it was a captured population, no pun intended, and uh, he would pay them $10 a week to do this. Mm -hmm. This was not done, and people in the main line in Philadelphia, and I did my medical training at the University of Pennsylvania, so I know the landscape, I know the geography. So mm -hmm. Tuskegee is a continuous, continuous issue of history. That's just a... My, my soapbox. Yes. No, I appreciate it. I mean, as long as we in this country deem um, or allow uh, certain populations, whether it's prisoners, whether it's, um, you know, people of color, whether it's folk who uh, other faiths or uh, whether it's folk who uh, love differently than we do, as long as we allow the dehumanization um, of those folk, you're always going to set yourself up for for this for for that for those kinds of outcomes, um, and so we have to at every every um, every opportunity when someone says, "Well, you know, they deserve that," nah, get in their face. It's like, no, no, that's a human being just like you and I, and they and they um, they they are, they, are, they deserve every opportunity to flourish just like you do. There's there's no difference. So, I think we have to we have to check for, and we may lose some friends, you know, in the process. But I think we have to uh, more often than not, they'll grow. They'll think about what they did, and hopefully come back and realize that that's not um, that's not the way that we should operate as a society. And so, I uh, I applaud that. Mary Nell has her hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, I just in the last day or two got a, uh, an email from the Friends Committee on North Carolina legislation. And in it, in the body, it was the emails of the main three folks who are deciding whether Medicaid expansion will happen or not. So I put it in the chat if you want to send an email to those folks telling them what you've learned and what we need to do, that would be great. In my other, in my other role at the Justice Center, I'm a uh, registered lobbyist. And so I can tell you that uh, Donnie Lambeth is, um, you know, certainly on board uh, for expansion and has been, um, if you can, I'm not telling you not to contact him, but energy should certainly be expended towards Senator Crowick, Crowick and, uh, and Representative uh, Potts. Um, so, um, and, and a lot of them have valid you know, questions about you know, um, provider capacity, uh, but those are things that can be addressed uh, and I think are smaller things. So uh, be prepared for that to be the rebuttal or the response and uh, be able to push through that. But thank you for that. Thank you for that work, it's incredibly important. Any other I, I really, I really appreciate the focus on voters. I really appreciate the focus on um, in, in, in empowering folk on on the on the on the on the ground, and I think that uh, in and of itself is um, you know that with fighting back with your public voice, your very public and strong and respected voice, uh, is is um, sort of a one-two punch. Karen, maybe that's a good note on which to end, do you think? Um, were there any other questions? Dr. Munn, I think we're gonna carry your thoughts with us for a long time. I was gonna say through the day, but I think they'll go longer than that. So Karen, do you wanna do the final parting words? Yes, I, I just wanna agree with Robin. I think this was so thought provoking, some data that you know uh, I'd never seen before and just, 
I think we're all a little bit stunned. So <laughs> we have a lot to think about and I hope that the league will continue this conversation. We're so grateful to you, Dr. Munn, and all of you who have joined us these last several sessions and particularly today. Let's keep it going and thank you so much for coming. Thank, thank you everyone. All. Take care, you stay safe, stay well. Take care, bye-bye.